no one with a lot of people currently in the industry as soon as they talk about R, uh, that the first or uh, few of the thoughts they come into is data science. Okay, a lot of the people, uh, I think there was a quote in some time, data scientist is the most sexiest job of the century. It's a very highly paying job and a lot of people think, okay, I'll learn R or a few of the technologies and I'll become a data scientist. Uh, that's why I would like to start with this particular uh, slide. Uh, hopefully the visual uh, it's not that great, but I think the content is good on this slide. It tries to bring some of the key concepts. If you think about this as a Venn diagram with three different skills or attributes which we use the table is mathematics and statistical knowledge. That's a big area. Um, question on the phone. Okay. Expertise. It could be domain expertise and finance in other domains industries uh, which one may have that's another area and then comes the hacking skills the problem solving skills and the capability to really take some data or some kind of transformation and really bring you to that so that's kind of the three big areas if you would think and once we are trying to make a combination of these things and it's is an interesting slide it says okay these two things when you start machine learning if you start a mathematical statistics you and have some domain expertise you become more of a traditional researcher uh, what I want to highlight is the central holy grail out here, which is the data science. It's not something which you can just do it in a month or two. I'm very clear and direct about uh, data science, uh, data scientists, and there are a lot of people get excited. Uh, they reach us as well, like, okay, can you have a program for data scientists? I, that's why we don't even say that we don't have a training program for data scientists. We don't give that. That's not some. It's not easy to make somebody in a month or two. Uh, completely convert him from any space into data science. So that's, it's a journey. It's actually, um, it could be a year or more kind of a journey which people have to build. And I'm very cautious. I don't want people to get into that. Then they have two, three months, they get frustrated. What am I doing? It's not working out uh, because I think the expectations were too high. I think you did not understand the whole gamut of things. The suggestion, what we say is usually take in a particular area Maybe one of this, you can start with a data analyst or so the route for maybe a developer or engineer, build up yourself as an architect and just move to that area. There are various angles people approach. You could be a person who is great in statistics and using some of these tools, and then you build your knowledge and expertise in other areas, and then thinking. In fact, I have a similar blog, which is like a six hats of a data scientist, where I also talk about the similar kind of things. You need to have statistical knowledge, you need to have big data knowledge. You should have capabilities to write programming on your own. And, and most important of them is ability to communicate. Because many of these people have this uh, PhDs and data science background and all that is uh, some kind of data wrangling background. But the key part is to be able to communicate to the CFO, the CIO, the CEO of the company. Because end of the day, they are the ones who are going to make the decisions and transform this because data science is huge, it's a big event. Uh, it's not about writing a simple model and getting some report created. That's something a data analyst or a reporting analyst would do. For things which are more data science-y, I mean, I uh, could throw an example. Let's say, um, if you know some of the people, the UPS trucks and all that matter, FedEx and all those trucks, most of the time they can write turn. I don't know if you know that. Does anybody know that? So that's kind of a, uh, how did it all come about? So there is this research in data scientists who make some hypothesis, okay, because right turn in U.S. is a free turn, and it saves time, and it saves overall gas and fuel as well when you're wasting time and just standing in lane. So they have a specialized route in GPS, which doesn't go to a normal route, but always tries to take uh, right turns more often than what we do. A simple hypothesis. Somebody's decided, but it has to be validated. It has to be tested. Once it was done, there was a millions and millions of dollars saving the company proved, and many of these companies use now. All these logistic companies use those kind of GPSs. That's something a data scientist does. It has a, such a wide impact, and it has transformation. I think that's the decision, I think, of this even FedEx or UPS has to do it. It has to reach very C-level staff, which has to be convinced for that, so with all the data and medicine. So this person is to be able to convince in a very simple way so he may ha should have the background, the math and science and logic to be able to prove that point, but be able to still communicate to the C-staff because most of the C-staffs may not necessarily want to really go into two of the details. They want all the background, but just want 
final recommendation as well. So communication ability is equally important as well. Um, the industry which we, uh, which I have been uh, just my observations uh, is a lot of the data scientists initially were all PhD folks. Let's get PhD. Still, majority of the data science requirements are PhD. Uh, so it's a changing a little bit because uh, one of the challenges with data science PhD folks have nothing against them, but uh, they have a research mindset, which is like let's keep on doing. Maybe perfectionist, if you would say, keep on doing it and keep on doing it. And in a business world, you have to have a closure. That is the end point. You need to move on, make a decision, make the recommendation, make the implement it forward. So that's a gap. So I think that practicality aspect of it is coming together, and some of the businesses and companies saying, oh, it's okay to not have a PhD. There is sometimes a, a conflict of the mindset, if you would say. So just a preface, just wanted to add a data science aspect of it, because a lot of people just jump into that and say, I'm learning R and just want to become data science scientists. Not happening. Uh, that's just one of the pieces of the whole puzzle. It's a big puzzle to solve. Okay, uh, so that's, let's start with that. Uh, with that, let's go to the next part, which is R. What is R? Uh, there's a lot of jargon over here. It talks about the statistical graphical tool. Uh, it's open source, meaning any, it's not proprietary by any company. You can download it for free. You can use it, and that's one of the reasons it competes pretty heavily with other tools uh, because it makes it very cheaper. Uh, some of the information uh, things around it. So it has a core and several add-ons which ha it has along with it. But this is a preferred, I prefer this slide. I think I try to make my thinking is simplicity. That's what we need, simplicity in any places. That's why the iPhones are great, because they are simple, right? So keeping it simple, the theme for today's discussion will be around these three points. The, even the concepts which we are talking about, and even the demo is in similar line. So we want you guys to have some takeaway uh, from this session and keep it as simple as it could be basic, but it should be something which you can take away home and back. So if I want to think about data science, uh, R as a tool, what can it do? It can do several things. I mean, we are going to talk about several things, but at a high level, I want to break into three parts. One is the data manipulation. We call it munching, wrangling, several terms are around the industry. But the ability to connect to different data sources, get the data, manipulate, slice, dice, transform, process, whatever we call it, that capability is a huge big deal, uh, which any programming language and R also does that. So that's the first key part of it, data manipulation tool. Tech is goes most on the statistical side, the capability to model. Uh, in fact, R has most of the strengths or history behind in statistics. Uh, most of the statisticians have years and years, for decades, have been using R for its statistical capabilities and modeling strengths, which it has. A uh, huge set of libraries, lots of different functions which you can build on top of it. So that's the second part of the theme which we'll be talking about. Uh, then the third part is about the ability to visualize, uh, data visualization using R. Uh, it has a decent amount of capabilities, but by no means uh, it's a visualization tool only. If people start comparing with tools like Tableau or Click or Power BI, MicroStrategy, that's not what we are talking about. I think uh, the strength of R is other things, but it does visualization. That's the way I uh, would like to say it. It does do visualization, but that's not the core strength. Nobody is going to buy or implement R for primary visualizations only, unless they are using one of the top two other things. Make sense? So that's the kind of theme which we want to follow through. There are three steps. You are merging the data, you are possibly modeling it, sometimes not. Uh, and possibly visualizing it. So these are strong capabilities which are provided as a tool. Uh, it does several of those things which we talked about. It has open source, maintained by community, not owned by any company, but there is some, some dialects to that as well. For example, the company which um, Revolution Analytics, one of the core companies which is driving a lot of this stuff, recently got acquired by, recently I say a couple of years back, got acquired by Microsoft. So Microsoft has Revolution Analytics, that doesn't mean like R is still not still open source still, but revenue is part of Microsoft. So Microsoft Microsoft is spending a lot of energy and time into R. Uh, their SQL servers are getting embedded with R. I think that we were in some conferences and lots of capabilities being 
uh, Power BI is getting added with us. They are plugging in R in any of their um, component set, uh, whether it is Power BI, whether it is SQL Server, or whatever it may be. So Microsoft is coming pretty heavy on R as well, which is a good thing. So if you are getting into the area of R, you are in the area of R, it's good for you because big weights are really uh, spending a lot of investment into this area. So, but I would have said, keep this in mind, one, two, three, managing the data, modeling the data, and visualize it. History, uh, as I said, it has been there for quite some time. Uh, there was a uh, language called S, and R was built on top of it. It was inherited all the S capabilities uh, back in 1993, so quite some time in the industry, quite stabilized. Uh, there is some phrasing I think I saw somewhere online, I think when I was prepping for that, uh, it was, uh, that is a stable version came out in 2014. I still need to validate that, uh, but that's what is happening um, in terms of history a little bit. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, Ross and Robert, you were mentioning yeah in another session, yeah. <laughs> So this is where we open the debate a little bit, uh, or discussion between the groups. Uh, when we start talking about R, definitely a lot of people start thinking, what about Python? What about Java? What about this? What about SAS? Is this something? So let's uh, tackle the elephant in the room first, back right in the beginning itself. Um, no one right answer. I mean, I can't say you like you have to use R or something. There is preferences. There are choices which companies make, and how do they make it? There are several things which go behind it. Uh, most of the common thing goes is expertise, who you have in your team, who people have used in the past. Oh, I have used Python. I would like to do that. If I'm building a team, I'll just continue using Python. That's a huge driver. That's like discounted a lot, but that's many times that has happened. Getting resources, skill sets is big. Um, the architecture team in the company or the team, the enterprise architect or the team architect, the solution architect could be driving a lot of the decisions. They would be taking the pros and cons, decisions, the requirements, the use cases, uh, and matching it with the skill capabilities and thinking about what is the best choice. And again, but there could be always bias. There's always bias because of expertise, past experiences, good or bad, either way. So that can happen. So let's quickly go and few the points. I'm not going to go everything. R is mentioned in 2014 for the stabilized uh, release, which happened, uh, but I think it's more 1993. Uh, is that right? In, here, uh, there are some of the things which I would debate on this one, and many people could. I'll open up the discussion once I go through this a little bit. Uh, what R is actually says it's difficult to learn. I disagree. R is very easy. Things which are like one to three step by step, it's very easy. Uh, but it's just like the uh, just a key, just a get an entry point to it. Uh, there are tons and tons of uh, libraries which are available. I don't think so anybody knows all the libraries. And you're not even expected to know. You should know what kind of capabilities exist, and when the time comes, use those tools and uh, features and libraries to build things which you have to. You may have to explore, research, <clears throat> take help. All that is fine. Uh, so getting started with R is very easy, uh, but to be a master in that and having an immense amount of knowledge, that's where it could be uh, difficult or tricky, and that's what I think they may be highlighting here. Um, it goes back to your earlier point about yeah. the hacking skills. Um, like you have to be able to understand the concept, understand the business, right? Your business, what the business is trying to do, where they're trying to move, and then thinking um, about manipulating and understanding what is the path that would be taking to solve the problem. It's all about understanding the business problem first and getting it. Um, there are tons of resources available online that you can just access and, you know, people have, uh, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. People have already done most of the difficult work, but it's, it's really about understanding the problem and how, how are you going to solve the problem. That's where the difficult part comes in. Right, right. Thanks, thanks, thank you for liking. And that's where the hacking, uh, which we're talking about, comes into play uh, as well. Um, in terms of what is mentioned, it's uh, some of the, uh, Interpreter based, it's more similar to Python from that perspective. Java has the compilation piece. So, all that differences do are present. Um, Python and Java are more of a general purpose tools. Um, 
are still get some specialization because of its more strong statistical capabilities, that background which it brings in. It can do visualizations. Uh, not that great, I don't, I, as I said before as well, it's not the strength of art, it has the capabilities. Uh, other tools, it will be really, you have to really hack it and make it happen. They do not uh, natively come with that capabilities. Um, this, it's mentioned easy, uh, Python is easy. Yes, it is very easy English kind of a language. Like if somebody is getting into programming or coding, Python could be your friend. Uh, not the snake Python, but uh, this language Python. It could be a big uh, entry, great entry point. It's very powerful, but it's uh, very easy as well. It's more English like if you have used it. So uh, against Java, which is a more machine, close to machine language, I think I would say that Java could be harder for people who have not used it. Yes. Who knows it? They will say it's easy. But I would change the statement out here and say Java is could be relatively easy. Core Java may be okay, but as you go into more comprehensive and advanced Java, it could get complicated. So uh, Java is there's two sets of people in the world. There's one who loves it, and there is nothing in the middle. Uh, either you love it or you just hate it. So that's the two categories that Java goes into. So, so maybe somebody who really likes it or loves it uh, wrote this slide. Okay. So R is mostly used for data analysis, um, whether it is data science, data analysis, all of the data-related projects. But uh, Python could be more web development, or uh, Java could be some kind of uh, web development as well, or some kind of application. If you all that kind of general purpose uh, programming tools, it can happen more on the other tools. They never came in from the data perspective. Now more and more data is happening in Python and Java compared to what was happening before. Um, and Python, I think there are a few slides which we'll talk about. Python is getting a good share of data analysis now, very, very recently. Uh, not so much, but it's, it's a good chunk of there. So with that, I'll open up the conversation. Uh, people chime in, please. Uh, you have, when we are talking, we're going to talk about SaaS as well. So now, uh, let me do that first. Uh, the big debate is about this. Uh, the R versus SaaS thing, that could be the competition or discussion, but it's, Again, a different kind of a debate. Uh, what happens with SaaS, it's a proprietary company. Uh, it's very expensive. Uh, all the tools and rich uh, set which they have, like they have different like SaaS BI, SaaS, SaaS, so many of those components, they're quite expensive. Not a small company or a startup would want to do that. Uh, this is mostly big enterprises who have huge investments uh, would take team effort to it. Uh, there are pros and cons, depending on what you're trying to do. If you are trying to get into a proprietary area, stabilized company, more so that's where SAS plays into role. It's expensive to get certifications, trainings, all of that as well. So all that comes in. But it has a more secure product. It has a more enterprise capabilities. Uh, there's support available when you have problems. So all the pros come with, uh, with the cost as well. Um, they are limited because it's developed by only a set of people, employees of SaaS companies, right? Uh, while in R, which is open source, it's democratic. It's like anybody and everybody in the world can contribute. Uh, and that's why it opens up more set of libraries, uh, capabilities. It is cost uh, cheaper. Uh, and that's why Bay Area, which is more of a more tech-oriented people, more startup-oriented people, uh, they believe like, okay, we can hack it ourselves. We can make it happen. Uh, we don't need so much support. We don't need so much of handholding, the inclination toward that is R. But the rest of the world, probably East Coast, other sides of the world, uh, it's more pharmaceuticals and companies uh, are inclined towards that. So that's, that's kind of the few touch points. There could be large discussion which we can see. And people who have used it, please, please chime in. Um, yes. Last, last. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of comparing that SAS may be more better for large, bigger sets of data compared to R. R is more like, okay, take your model, just build onto it, and then you do something with your bigger set of data. So it's kind of playground or experimental ground before we go there. Was there a question on the phone? Yeah, but like if we are talking about big data, that means like we are handling in the billions of data sets. So that means if this is a major uh, limitation for R in that case. Statements? Um, maybe it's got a more kind of a, I would, I would say it's kind of major restriction for R. You said you have to load the data set 
to RAM and then working with large data sets could be a problem, right? Yeah, yeah. So it is, it is in certain ways, but it's not that limited. It can have substantial amount of data. Uh, again, it's more about uh, creating a model, creating the thing, and then once you have tuned your model, you have your system ready, uh, then you take it into a bigger set of data. It's more of those, you cannot do it in the whole set anyway. So if you're thinking of your model, I think if I have like everybody in the universe, uh, all the people's records, uh, the DNA, and I'm trying to create a model and kind of pattern on top of it, I cannot process all the data and then give the answer. I cannot take billions and billions of people's data. What I would do is take a subset of data, sampling, some kind of random set which will be generated, and through that which you'll do it, and then you'll push it out uh, for the rest of the world. So got, got it, got it. That's there. So it, it is not truly limiting it completely, like it cannot be used, but yes, just a comparative uh, difference it is. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right, right, yeah. Our uh, big part of the big data uh, tool set uh, and stack is quite a lot. Any other people? I think there's a lot of people who were using Python, SAS. Uh, Please chime in. I think that's what uh, it's important. I think uh, there's so many different viewpoints and angles. I think we need to converse and bring that to the front. I mean, these are few uh, feature set or pointers only. Anybody on the phone questions or even the room? Please. Mentioning they're using SaaS. I mean, um, is that a um, Bay Area based company or um, outside? If you would like to chime. I'm always curious about which companies in Bay Area are using SaaS. There are not many. Uh, Bay Area is really more, let's do it ourselves attitude. Okay. Maybe not. I mean, if somebody's speaking, they may be speaking on mute. Uh, so mm -hmm. just be aware of that. That you know, the company has to put in a lot of overhead, and there's a big investment, and they're not gonna just kind of get rid of it, right? Like they're gonna keep it for five, seven, ten years. Um, and those companies are usually um, one that have been around for a really long time and don't have an analytics culture. Um, and then you know, the other types are on the opposite spectrum where they do have analytics culture, but then they have data that's so large that it needs a proprietary tool and uh, maybe R, um, you know, can't handle all of it. And they may supplement, actually some of them supplement both. Nice. You start with R, you do analysis, you don't want to, you know, spend time like learning the tools that are moving that model into um, maybe a bigger proprietary tool. And yeah, you have used uh, SAS as well as well, so yeah, thanks. Okay, so let's keep moving. So this is some of the uh, numbers, and I think I was looking for different uh, infographics, and uh, uh, as you see, for data scientist perspective, I think that because data scientist as I said, is a person most likely hacking attitude, uh, I'll do it myself, can do it a lot of stuff, uh, um, for data science, just for data science perspective. And there was a year over the year thing as well, uh, which was explaining this, I think, is 2016 one, uh, because the one which I saw in 2015 didn't even have Python much over a year, uh, almost like single digit or two, three percentage of things. So Python is definitely growing its share in productive analytics, uh, considerably eating more of the chunk from SAS and a little bit of R as well. Uh, there are some great uh, infographics. I should have brought that other one as well, which is 2015 from 2016. So, uh, SAS, you know, kind of how SAS is used in uh, uh, You know, I know R and Python, uh, uh, you know, uh, they use a lot of uh, you know, machine learning, for example, uh, classification and clustering and all to predict the outcomes. They can class in SAS as well. Uh, you know, I mean, for analysis, data analysis, yes, but predictive analytics, you know, I, I, I didn't come across a lot of scenarios. Uh, you know, with SAS or predictive, so just just out of curiosity, how is SAS used for predictive? Um, 
but I, I know that they actually have a um, like a proprietary component. So you know they have multiple different tools. So one is like a visualization component. I think they have um, like a SAS component, uh, statistics component, where its capability is just to do all of the models and things like that, and the predictive uh, model is part of that. SAS has a lot of tools. Sorry. driver, the humongous amount of licensing fees uh, that uh, versus free. It's, it's very, it's a huge uh, difference out there. So that, that's where it uh, starts most of the time. And that's why big companies could go for that. Smaller companies, no chance. Uh, startups, I don't think so, think of, even think about it. That's, that's not even the list. Let's move on. Uh, maybe Python and R become an option. So somebody was uh, commenting or question, had a question on the phone. If not, let's keep moving. So this is another uh, set of information around similar way respondent. Uh, this is like the previous one also for KD Nuggets. Uh, they take a lot of surveys and information, different data tools, what have been used. Uh, sets way on the top of the list. Um, that could be another reason to think about uh, why it is very popular in the data community uh, so much. The tool set. Uh, so. The tool is Stanford used. Okay. Sorry, Stanford. Stanford, the professor teaching using the lab. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. I mean, this is separate survey thing company do, does it. Um, so it's just from there. I think there's definitely more tools and things like that. Uh, is that a Stanford course you're talking about? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, and MATLAB other people talk about, but that's more focused in certain domains. Uh, this could be more, because what happens is it's been more finance and FinTech focused. When you take a survey, uh, just because of the nature of the numbers, it just starts going down, right? Because the FinTech focused people will be less, uh, and others are um, overriding their posts. So that's maybe one of the reasons uh, it could be not there. In terms of tool, it's more very plain textile kind of format of things which you write. Uh, the closest graphical which comes into tool set is this R Studio. Most of the people like that interface. I think when we're going to talk about the demo, we're going to bring that up. It's free. It's very easy to install, get up running, either a Mac or a standalone instance, very fast. I think it should be within an hour, somebody can get up and running and doing some decent amount of things in R. Uh, that's why it's very, very easy to get started. Yes, taking mastering it takes months and years. Uh, that's the difference. But getting started is very, very uh, easy. Uh, so we'll share that in the uh, demo part when we do that. Uh, now let's see the other capabilities in terms of the other sets of things which we were talking, the theme which we were talking about, uh, the manipulating the data, able to model the data, and visualize. So let's go with that theme. To be able to first of all manipulate the data, the key part is you have to get the data. And R provides a rich set of uh, possibilities over there. The data could be coming from simple files, which you can most of the time drag and drop, uh, bring into your system. Uh, it can connect to databases. So a lot of the data in the traditional enterprises are sitting in the databases. You can connect uh, to the, uh, write your code. Once you have made the connection out here, you can start interacting. Uh, and creating objects and instance data sets on top of it. Uh, the database is definitely a possible. Uh, also, allows you to get data from the web. So you can point out to a URL. Okay. And then get some data set from the web as well. So that adds another whole world of data scraping, if you would think like in some way, uh, helps you to get certain, certain, some, some amount of data from the web as well. Uh, from objects. Uh, was there some question? I think that we are getting some background noise from someone. 
Yeah, yeah, one question I have. Um, so here you show files, databases, web, and R objects. So if you need big data, Hadoop is something which comes to our mind first, right? So it can connect the Hadoop and get the data. Or, um, directly through Hadoop, um, I haven't played around with that part myself. I don't know if somebody uh, else has done that uh, too much, but I'm not aware directly that you can hit in Hadoop in connect to R and do that uh, directly. Okay. Like, can you connect to R to like Hadoop? No, right? Okay. Visualization tools like Tableau and all of that have the capability to connect to R. But that's not definitely not uh, Hadoop specific. It's more visualization uh, tools. They have capabilities to connect to R and uh, provide a statistical edge to your uh, data as well, not just basic data which is coming in and out. Uh, just looking in a different way, you can do some powerful statistical thing on top of it as well. So we'll have to check, Ravi, for the, you on that. Um, we can follow up that question back. Yeah, please. Okay. Please. Yeah, thank you. Sure, no problem. Okay. Um, moving on, once you got the data, you did some processing, you did some transformation, the, the next step or final step possibly could be getting the data out to some downstream systems. You have done the model, you've done something, um, process the data, and here are the key possibilities which you have in terms of getting the data out. You can send to a simple file, uh, you can be in target systems, databases again, uh, you can also create our object on top of it. You can save it as an R object, and this cycle can go on and became a very complex, multi-tiered uh, processing data pipeline, which can be built on top of it, tier by tier. So that's because of this set of huge set of data in capabilities and out capabilities, it can be used in variety of uh, use cases which you may have. So that opens up the door for all of that. We call this as a kind of a Swiss army. It can do a lot of different things, and it has all these capabilities embedded within it uh, to do modeling, to do all this data crunching, all of that. So with that team, let's look at a few of the features. We are not going to go line by line into those things, but it has all these rich capabilities to index your data. We have an array of data, integers, characters, logical uh, billions, so many different ways you can yeah, index that data. You can take the data, you can create a subset of it data, uh, just take part of it, do some different kind of processing for these parts. Transformation is a big piece of it because you're not just taking data in and out. It's basically some kind of processing intelligence has to be built on top of it, and that's where uh, transformation comes into picture. You can cut your data uh, into continuous groups. You can form different groups and categories for some kind of different processing. Uh, the red or maroon kind of color, which mm -hmm. is trying to highlight uh, what are different capabilities it does exist. Uh, what are all different things that you can do on mm -hmm. top of that data set. Uh, put all together, it gives kind of the pipeline that you get, got the data, you were able to subset it, transform it, various levels of transformation. Typically, you will not transform one transformation. It will be series of transformations, taking a data and resulting in a thing. Uh, you can start with a bigger set of data. You could filter out several pieces focus on your things and just do output. Let's say I want to campaign, uh, marketing campaign, a group of people. Uh, let's we start with a demographic. Let's say everybody in Bay Area. Then we start looking in certain pieces of demographics, their interest level, education level. We keep on doing that kind of transformations, filtering, and finally we may have the data which we want to market our data. So limited amount of uh, investments which we may have for marketing campaigns, we can use effectively and that's one of the examples that you can think about taking data, transforming it, and setting it out. So this mostly applies to the first piece of it. Getting the data, munching the data, processing the data, it has lots of lots of capabilities around that. Uh, the core strength, as I said, is towards the modeling capabilities. It has powerful modeling syntax, all the relationships, different kind of formats can be running. This Y is related to X. For example, growth is related to sun and water, just simple examples. Uh, relationships, all that modeling uh, is in built to libraries. A huge set of like thousands of libraries uh, capabilities are allowed. If you think from a statistical model, it, uh, it can do linear model or any kind of model uh, as we were talking about a uh, few seconds or minutes back. Uh, the linear is talking about 
typically goes in the C format. When you see the demo as well, we'll be going in a similar format. You start with a um, model. Uh, it could be linear model, logistical regression, whatever it may be. Uh, you finally examine it. You typically, you start with summary. You summarize that. And finally, you plot that object which you have. So this is a, uh, that's why I call it easy. I like it. Whenever things are structured, you can do obviously one, two, three. Uh, life is simple. Uh, it makes it life better. Uh, it's a predictable model. You can just, anybody can come up and start doing this. But I think now the knowledge of whether to use linear model and those things, that's where it gets complicated. That's the knowledge of domain, your use case, all this comes to play. But otherwise, as a tool, it is very structured and simple. Uh, another example, again, using logistical model over here, but again, it is a pattern. You have an object defined, you have summarizing it, uh, to examine it, and finally plot it. When you see the demo, I think this will hone in much better, uh, and we'll read it at that point. Last but another feather in the cap in R is visualization. It's not that straightforward and easy if you have used tools like Tableau or uh, MicroStrategy or other tools of Power BI, like literally drag and drop. The world is moving towards that more and more, and uh, that makes possibilities to self-service and things like that. Uh, by no means is that. If you have to visualize, it's nothing like you literally have to see, write this kind of set of code uh, to create visualizations. Uh, ggplot is very commonly used. I'm not going to go again in interest of um, keeping it to 101 level, not go into those lines and details, but that capabilities exist. You can create various kind of plots. A box plot can be created. Again, you try to find the same set of libraries, set of ggplot, again, most of the time, uh, that is. So all of that can be transformed, and you can create different kind of charts on top of it. It's not uh, like a set of tools and you just click and drag and different kind of pie charts and all those things, that capabilities is not native to it, but it has definitely uh, capabilities to do it. Okay, the last piece I think on that is histograms. There are various of those, but I eventually look the theme as finally you have to write, get your data, do some kind of modeling, transformations, possibly you might do this piece optionally or may not do it, but capabilities does exist. Uh, I think I pause it for the questions or comments. Anybody has, has with so far core things, what we're going to do, as we said, we're going to do the concepts, um, get some of the resources for people, and then we'll, um, later part we'll go to the demo. Any any questions on so far brought in topics? <laughs>